All right, so now that we've reviewed mitosis and meiosis in the previous lecture, in this lecture we're going to go over the cell cycle, its components, and then the regulation of it. So we've gone through the cell cycle very briefly in some of the previous lectures, so we're really going to dive in and go through the different phases and its regulation, especially in this lecture. So the cell cycle is defined as a regulated cycle of stages that cells go through to replicate their DNA and divide. So that's the two things that are key there, is their replicating DNA and then cell division. So those are, the, those are the two end functions of the cell cycle. And this is done in a regulated fashion because if cells uncontrollably divide, that's what cancer is. And they really consist of, of two major phases, which you've kind of touched on, especially in the last lecture. So you have interphase, which we talked about with mitosis and meiosis. And interphase, as you can see here, is really the majority of the cell cycle. And it's really, the purpose of interphase is to get ready for cell division. And so as a part of that, you're going to do RNA and protein synthesis during the G1 and the G2 phases. And then you're going to do DNA synthesis during the S phase. Then you, and then you get into the M phase, which is mitosis and cytokinesis. So the phases of the cell cycle specifically, so you have G1, which is also known as the first growth phase. And so during this, you have RNA and protein synthesis that's in preparation for DNA synthesis and DNA replication during the S phase. Then after the DNA is replicated, you proceed to the G2 phase or the second growth phase. This is where you have more RNA and protein synthesis. However, this is in preparation for cell division, which occurs during the M phase or mitosis. In gametes, this would be meiosis, but we're talking about the majority of cells here, so we're going to refer to it as mitosis. And this is where you have duplicate chromosomes, and you have duplicate chromosomes because you replicated them in the S phase. They are evenly distributed into two daughter cells. So you start out with one cell, you go through all those phases of PMAT, and then C, cytokinesis, so prophase, metaphase, antiphase, telophase, and cytokinesis, and then you end up with two identical daughter cells. Now, the G0 phase or G0 phase, this is over here. This is where cells essentially leave the cell cycle and they're not dividing, they're not replicating their DNA, they're just stable. And the cells that are in the, the G0 phase are typically cells that are not gonna further divide anymore. And the two famous examples of that are nervous tissue, especially in the central nervous system, and then also cardiac muscle. And this is part of the reason why a stroke and a heart attack are so devastating is because if you have a stroke in the brain, you know, nervous tissue in the brain is not actively dividing and it's not really capable of it. And so when you lose brain tissue as a result of an infarction, you can't get that tissue back. And that's why, you know, there can be such devastating residual deficits after a stroke. Same thing with a heart attack, you can't regenerate cardiac muscle. So that's why patients after they have a heart attack, they can be, their cardiac function can be compromised. And so, because again, you can't regenerate that cardiac muscle. And so that's, that's a part of the reason why these two conditions can be so devastating. So cell cycle regulation, this is a process that is heavily regulated because again, you can develop cancer. And so as you progress through the cell cycle, there's checkpoints mainly at this point and this point that are going to prevent you from, and then within mitosis, that will prevent any kind of abnormal cell formation. And, and examples of that could be you know, damage to DNA, mutations in DNA that are caught. And so if let's say there's a mutation that occurs during DNA synthesis. You don't want to proceed, just jump into mitosis. You want to halt there and correct that. And so because you don't want to pass that on to daughter cells, However, if that's not caught and it just proceeds, that's an example of where cancer can occur. So you have the G1 checkpoint, which is here, and the G1 checkpoint prevents progression to the S phase. So it's making sure that everything is properly prepared for DNA synthesis. The G2 checkpoint is here. It's right after the G2 phase. And these are easy to remember. The G1 is after G1, G2 phase is after G2. And so the G2 prevents progression to mitosis. Here, you're, again, you're going to be making sure everything's in order for cell division, making sure you have the proper machinery, making sure the DNA is intact, there's no mutations. And then you have the M checkpoint, which is in, in this point right here. 
at this dotted line. And this is to halt completion of mitosis if the spindle is damaged or abnormal. So if you remember, you have your mitotic spindle like this, form of microtubules. And you have your chromosomes that are initially brought into the center during uh, metaphase. So if you remember, you have these guys like this. And then you proceed to anaphase where you're going to start pulling these apart, remember? And so you're going to start pulling these apart like this, and they're going to go to their respective sides. Same thing here. And same thing here. We're just drawing a few examples here for you. And so again, you're doing this. And a big function of this M checkpoint is to prevent uneven segregation of chromatids. And so here, everything's evenly segregated. You've pulled these apart. An example of that, if we go over here, is let's say, let's say you just, you don't pull this chromosome, and so it's empty here. And then, you know, you did pull it here, you did pull it here, and same thing here. So these guys are fine, they're going off to their respective areas, but here, you have uneven segregation of these chromatids. And so you do, wouldn't want to, this is what's called non-disjunction, where you're going to have uneven numbers of chromosomes. So in this, eventually when you divide, you're going to have this cell is going to have, you know, one more, this cell is going to have one less, and that's going to create a problem. And as you'll see in the genetics unit, that can result in significant genetic diseases. So you want to prevent that from happening. So that's one big function of the M checkpoint. The other one is for daughter cells with abnormal numbers of chromosomes. Now that's tied to this. There's other reasons why you could have abnormal numbers of chromosomes as well. This is just one mechanism. There's other mechanisms as well. And so the, but the point is, is that it's, it wants to make sure, as you can see here with both of these, that you're making sure each daughter cell has the same amount of genetic information, meaning they have the same number of chromosomes. So the following two types of proteins are highly involved in cell cycle regulation. And so you have cyclin-dependent kinases, or CDKs, and this is in the name. They're dependent on activation from cyclin binding, which is the other protein type. And so they're a kinase, so they phosphorylate regulatory proteins. They're involved in regulating progression of the cell cycle. And really it's at these checkpoints, this G1 point, this G2 point, and then this M checkpoint. Then you have cyclins, and they bind to these CK, CDKs, and they activate them. And they're actually phase-specific. So you have, you have a G1 cyclin, you have a G1-S1 cyclin, you have an S cyclin, G2, and then you have an M cyclin. And they're actually, these, these phase-specific cyclins are present in higher concentrations during their corresponding phase of the cell cycle. So let me, let me draw a graph here and explain that. So if we draw the graph like this... This is concentration C. You start with G1 here, so this is all G1. Then you have S phase here, G2 here, and then lastly, you have the M phase here. So let's start with the G1 cyclin. This continuously grows through to the G1 phase, and it actually stays elevated throughout the other phases, and then it starts to come back down during the M phase. So that's the G1 cyclin. That makes sense that it's elevated during this, this phase of the cell cycle. It's going to want to ensure that there's proper regulation of this phase. Next, you have the G1S cyclin. So this is actually going to spike right here at this G1S checkpoint. And so that makes sense. This one is going to be highly involved in this very critical step of when you go from the first growth phase to where you actually go through DNA replication and preparation for cell division. This is a very important step in the cell cycle, probably the most highly regulated step. And so it makes sense that this cyclin is really going to spike here to make sure that this aspect of the cell cycle is regulated. Then you have the S cyclin, which is starting to pick up pace during the last end of the G1 phase. And then it really grows during the S phase. And that makes sense. It's going to want to ensure that the S phase is properly regulated. And then it comes out and it peaks here kind of at the beginning of G2 and then comes back down sharply all the way down to zero during the M phase. And so that's your S cyclin. And then lastly, you have the M cyclin. So this is going to pick up traction during the S phase, but then it's really going to get elevated right before you enter the M phase. And that makes sense. It's going to be at its peak point during the M phase. And so you want to be regulating the mitosis aspect. So that'll be your M cyclin.
And so in, in conclusion about this graph here, just really the take home message is that that the concentrations of each of these cyclins are elevated during their corresponding phase. And then they taper down as you progress throughout the cell cycle. And so these cyclin CDK complexes, so you have, you have a cyclin that is bound to a CDK. So if you have a CDK like this, so this is your CDK, so it's inactive. And then you have a cyclin like this, comes in and binds it. And then you have the complex like this. So cyclin like here, CDK here, and this is active. And you're adding phosphate groups to regulatory proteins. And so these regulate entry into the S phase from the G1 checkpoint. So here's your G1 checkpoint here, and you're regulating that entry point there. And then you're regulating entry into mitosis at the G2 point. And then you're regulating exit from mitosis at the M checkpoint, so right before cell division or cytokinesis, which is right here. So briefly, we'll talk about the cell types. We've already talked about this a few slides ago. There's permanent cell types, so they enter into this G0 or G0 phase, and they never come back into the cell cycle. So they're done replicating. And again, the examples of that are neurons, especially in the central nervous system, skeletal and cardiac muscle, and then red blood cells as well. And so there's some cells that can come out of G0 and enter back into the cell cycle, but these cells usually do not. Those cells would be called stable or quiescent, so they're stable, they're quietly hanging out in G0. However, they're actually capable if there's an external stimulus. And so an example of that would be hepatocytes in the liver. And the liver is the site of, of filtering out toxins and drugs. And so if there's significant external stimulus from that, you, and you have hepatocytes that have died off, you can certainly replace those hepatocytes by re-entering the cell cycle. The other example is lymphocytes. So a perfect example of an external stimulus would be an infection. And so to fight off the infection, you need to reproduce new lymphocytes. That, could, that also happens during you know, autoimmune reactions as well. And then you have labile cells, which are rapidly dividing cells that really never enter the G0. So they're, they're just constantly going around and around and around the cell cycle. And they progress rapidly through G1 because they're wanting to get to the S phase and get, get the DNA replicated. Examples of this are bone marrow, which, you know, you're constantly creating new red blood cells, new white blood cells. There's a lot of high turnover. Intestinal epithelium, this also makes sense because you have a lot of turnover there because the intestinal epithelium is coming in contact with a lot of different substances from our diet. You have hair follicles because you're always growing new hair. Skin, again, because skin is interacting with the external environment, sunlight, things like that. It it's, incurs a lot of damage, so you're constantly generating new skin for that and then germ cells as well. Now, these cells are most affected by cytotoxic chemotherapy versus targeted chemotherapy, which is that newer age which targets specific proteins that are molecular drivers of cancer. And so those targeted therapies don't necessarily affect rapidly dividing cells more so than any other cell. They just target tumor cells that are affected by whatever protein they're targeting versus cytotoxic are more generic. And so they're sure they're gonna affect tumor cells that are rapidly dividing, but they're also going to affect these cells as well. And that's why you see patients that have, cancer patients that are on these therapies, they can have low white count, they can have low, they can have anemia, they can have GI symptoms, you know, like vomiting, bad diarrhea. Fortunately, they lose their hair and so on. They can become infertile. All right, so we're going to come back to cell cycle regulation here, and we're actually going to focus on P53 because this is probably the most important and high-yield regulator of cell cycle progression. It's considered a tumor suppressor protein, and because of its major role in cell cycle progression, it can be downregulated in many cancers. And as you imagine, if you're not able to halt the cell cycle when certain DNA damage is, is detected, that can lead to uncontrolled cell division, which then leads to cancer. So first, the functions, P53 functions by binding to DNA. So a major part of its function is actually as a transcription factor, and it carries out the following actions. So it activates expression of DNA repair proteins to help repair DNA damage and prevent passing on mutations or damaged genes onto subsequent cell divisions. 
It can also arrest the cell cycle at the G1S checkpoint if DNA damage is recognized. So here's that G1S checkpoint. So if you detect DNA damage here, you can arrest the cell cycle, induce this DNA repair. However, if it's found that this DNA damage is irreparable, then P53 can initiate apoptosis because if it's beyond repair, you should just kill off the cell because there's no point in passing on damaged DNA and potentially mutations onto subsequent cells. And then lastly here, it can help facilitate senescence in response to short telomeres. Remember we talked about telomeres. Those are those sequences at the end of chromosomes to help protect them from damage and, and chromosome tr translocations. However, if they become so shortened that they no longer can carry out their protective function, senescence is, a, is the proper state for the, the cell to enter because at that point it will not be undergoing any further cell divisions. And that is a good thing because you don't want to risk passing on damaged DNA or potential mutations. So we have this sequence here with these arrows and then this fig full figure in your book. First, we're just going to focus on this part of the figure and then we'll go through the other parts of the figure and then this sequence here. So first two main proteins we want to talk about here. You got the retinoblastoma protein or RB protein and then E2F. So when RB protein is active, it is bound to ETF and inactivates it. So active, inactive. Okay. And then over here you have CDK4 and cyclin D bound. So this is one of those CDK cyclin complexes. And then you have CDK2 and cyclin E. So this is another of one of these complexes. And you can see these guys here. And they will phosphorylate retinoblastoma. So they will add a phosphate because they're kinases and that's what kinases do. So they'll phosphorylate retinoblastoma protein. And you can see that here where it's phosphorylated. By doing that, they free up E2F, and then E2F can move down here and bind to the DNA and carry out its transcription factor function and promote progression of the G1 phase into the S phase of the cell cycle. So at that G1 S checkpoint, E2F can be responsible for moving it through that checkpoint and into the S phase. And one thing to point out here is that when retinoblastoma protein is active, this is tumor suppression because when RB is bound to E2F, this whole process down here doesn't happen. Now, P53, it stimulates the transcription of the P21 protein and the P16 protein. Because remember, P53 is a transcription factor. These proteins then come down and they inhibit these CDK cyclin complexes. If they inhibit these, then there's no phosphorylation that occurs. These two remain bound. ETF is inactive. And so now you've halted progression of the cell cycle at this G1S checkpoint. So when P53 gets active, because there's DNA damage, this sequence happens. You have these are transcribed, then you inhibit these, and then you prevent E2F because it's bound to RB protein, and you prevent E2F from binding to the DNA, and you've halted the cell cycle at that checkpoint. And so then you can carry out those DNA repair mechanisms. Now, if you have a cancer where P53 is mutated and it doesn't carry out its function, so you don't have these two guys, you don't have blocking of these CDK cyclin complexes. So then you have uncontrolled, unregulated phosphorylation of retinoblastoma. So then E2F gets freed up continuously. It can promote transcription and progression of G1 into the S phase. So there's pretty much just passing or blowing through that checkpoint. Then what happens is you're going to have unregulated cellular proliferation. And then if you have any DNA damage or mutations in there, you're going to pass that on to subsequent cell divisions, and that's going to lead to cancer. All right, so that closes out our lecture for the cell cycle. In the next lecture, we'll talk about some clinical pearls relevant to the cell cycle.